uh, today is the EU's trade policy. And as I believe Alonso pointed out in the session before, it is one of those core areas of European Union competences. So from the very early days, from the Treaty of Rome 1957, trade policy or commercial policy has been uploaded to the European Union level. So it's that one area where we have a lot of what many authors call communitarization, where we've got a lot of delegation of sovereignty given up to the, EU, to the European Commission in particular. And typically in textbooks, it's used as an example of that, of an area of core EU competences. Now what I'm going to argue today is that it's much more nuanced than that. That there is an interplay of ideas, interests, and also of interests of different institutions and different member states, and even different economic sectors within the European Union. So it really is, rather than a core competence, uh, much more of a conflicted area. In fact, uh, Sophie Meunier and uh, Pelosi Nicolaus call the EU a conflicted trade power. And that's basically what I'm going to be arguing throughout today's lecture. I'll start off by just pointing out why the EU is still relevant in terms of trade, why we should still think about it and consider it. Uh, I'll go on to describe a little bit of how the EU's trade policy operates, how it works, and then I'll say a little bit more about different ideas about trade and how it fits in with other policy areas and how they have developed over the last decades. Okay. Well, there we go. Um, the EU, in terms of trade, is still incredibly relevant. You know, we've been talking about the rise of China, the shift of power towards the Asian Pacific, particularly in economic terms. Um, but by all accounts, the EU is still the world's largest trader as a, as a unit, as a whole, as a whole group. Uh, it has a small percentage of the world's population, yet it is the world's second largest importer largest exporter, and it accounts for roughly 17% of total global trade. Now, increasingly when we talk about trade, we're also talking about things like services, things like what we're doing in this class today. So any of you who are not Australian nationals, uh, who come from another country and have come to Australia to study, this class today is part of Australia's external trade statistics, because it is a service. Uh, and it is part of that. Um, increasingly also when we talk about trade, we're also thinking about things like investment. And increasingly investment is becoming part of trade agreements between countries. And if we think about investment, uh, the European Union is still one of the largest sources of foreign direct investment for other parts of the world. It accounts for just under 50% of total investment flows. And it receives about a fifth of all of the world's foreign direct investment. Most of it, interestingly, comes from the United States. So the world's largest foreign direct investment relationship at the moment is still between the EU and the US. So discounting them at this particular moment is, is still a little bit too early to do that. And if we look here at this chart with um, percentages of global trade, this is in goods only, and of course it's in goods where the Asian countries have become particularly competitive, um, but we still see that the European Union has managed roughly to keep its share of global trade for goods. And a lot of China's rise has actually been at the expense of the United States, and a bit less at the expense of Europe. So what are the key questions? Well, what is the EU's trade policy? What does it do in practice? Who determines this policy? Who has the power to create it? And what determines the policy? So what are the kind of ideas and interests that underline the EU's trade policy? OK, so firstly, why is trade policy important to the EU? Why does it need trade policy? Well, if you remember from your other classes, when you were looking at the origins of the European Union, you'll remember it starts off as an economic Club. It starts off as a trade group, as a way of facilitating trade interactions between the original member states. And 
one of the effects of this is that if you're having a common market between a group of countries, they need to create common external tariffs. So anything that is coming in to that country has to have the same tariff. If you are, think of Australia for example, if you are an importer of um, French wines in Victoria, when you bring in those wines, you pay exactly the same tariff as if you were an importer of French wines in um, New South Wales. So there's one tariff for all of those goods coming into Australia, irrespective of where in Australia they come into. And the European Economic Community back in the day had to do the same thing, which means it starts to have to have a single voice to deal with the rest of the world in terms of trade. Um, in terms of EU theories, we could see this as what neo-functionalists call a spillover effect. Uh, it's one of the earliest policies of the EU, and significantly, it is the first external policy of the European community, and then European Union. And that's quite important because, as we will see later on in the lecture, the fact that it was the EU's first external policy tool has meant that trade policy has also been loaded with other foreign policy aims, because that was the one area that they could do at the European level. Whereas, as you know, militarily, uh, in other areas, it was very much at the member state level. And it's only been in the last decades that the EU has done some small steps towards um, being able to put on military or peacekeeping operations as the EU under an EU flag. Okay. So where does the policy come from? Who, uh, who comes up with the ideas? How does this work? Okay, who remembers who comes up with ideas in the EU? Who starts policies? Typically, it's the Commission. Bingo. Okay, this isn't coming out in the order I thought it would. So I'll just put them all out. There we go. It is typically the Commission, and in the case of trade, where more power has been delegated to the European institution, it is always the Commission. And the Commission will start the legislative or rolling. They'll come up with suggestions of what to do, whether they want to sign good trade agreements with other countries, with which countries, whom they're going to prioritize, and they will write that up and they will send it to the Council of the European Union, so the representatives of the member states, and at the same time to the European Parliament. And they will discuss it, they will have votes on it, to see whether they agree with it or not, whether they send it back to the Commission. And once they've agreed to do something, it goes back to the Commission. Now what's particularly interesting about the case of trade is that once you've got a common European position on something, it goes back to the European Commission, and the European Commission, on behalf of all of the member states, deals with the rest of the world. So it will be the European Commission's Commissioner for Trade who will go to the World Trade Organization and negotiate on behalf of all of the EU member states. It will be that Commissioner who will go to China and negotiate an investment agreement with the Chinese authorities. It will be that commissioner who will go, him or his uh, deputies, clearly. Uh, he's not only present, so he can't be in all the places all the time. And it will be him who goes to the United States to discuss the trade and investment agreement with the United States, instead of the ministries of trade from any of the EU member states. And that is a key difference between trade and other policy areas. Now, what's important about this, and the reason I put it on, on, on the slide, is that the European Commission, when it comes up with ideas, does not operate in a vacuum. So we're going to see when we look at interests that they get ideas from businesses, business groups, from NGOs, from lobbies, some of them at the European Union level, some of them at the national level, some of them are foreign. One of the most important lobbies in Brussels, particularly in issues of trade, is actually the American Chamber of Commerce and American multinational companies that have opened up offices in Brussels 
specifically to liaise with the European Commission and to give them input into their policy making. So it's not just member states or the European Commission, uh, it's a whole host of other actors that are involved in crafting and designing these policies. Now, we've mentioned that the European Commission has the right to initiate legislation. So they're the ones who are going to come up with the ideas. And of course, uh, they can't really do anything unless the Council, unless the member states agree to it. Um, so it creates a dynamic that people like Mark Pollock has, have described as a principal agent relationship. This is not unique to the European Union, but it fits in very well into the European context. And people like Manfred Elsig and others have written a lot about the principal agent relationship between the member states and the European Commission in the field of trade. Uh, they even brought out a special issue of the Journal of European Public Policy of 2007, specifically on the principal agent relationships and trade. Now, what's interesting about this uh, is that it is incredibly difficult to know who has the final say. So in order to prevent the agent, in this case the European Commission, from running off and doing whatever they might want in terms of international trade, the principles of the member state um, made sure that the treaties contained particular um, institutional arrangements that would enable them to keep a tab on the European Commission. And that is done through what is now called the Trade Committee. If you look at all the literature, it might be referred to as the Article 133 or Article 113 Committee. It's a different, uh, different treaties, I and mean, the number of the articles has changed. And what this trade committee is, is a group of representatives from the trade ministries of the 28 member states. And they meet weekly and discuss trade issues and are in constant contact with the European Commission to see what the Commission is doing. And they also accompany, maybe not the whole bunch of them, but a group of them will accompany the European Commission when it goes to the WTO, for example, or when it goes um, to the US to negotiate trade deals. And essentially, they sit in the mother room next door. And during the coffee breaks, they come in, ask the representatives of the European Commission, OK? What have you negotiated? How is this going? Uh, yes, you can do this. No, you can't do that. So there is a very close interaction between all of these different actors and these different groups. But it is indeed very difficult to say who has the final say. Uh, remember, the European Union at the moment is engaged in negotiations, as we'll see in a second, with almost every part of the world, uh, except Russia, Australia, New Zealand, and a few Central Asian states. As you can imagine, that's going to spread resources very thinly, not just at the European uh, institution level, but also at the member state level. So it means that the members of this trade committee from the individual member states are going to be quite hard pressed to follow every single negotiation terribly closely. And there are not that many people. So imagine if you're the only person looking at this, and you have to keep a tab on maybe 30 different sets of simultaneous negotiations, you're going to have a very hard time of it. So it is those issues that allow the European Commission, in some cases, to be able to push the boundaries a little bit and uh, push its own agenda forward in negotiations with other parts of the world. It's also important to distinguish and I think I'll also mention this earlier, between exclusive competences and mixed competences. And one of the things that we've seen uh, throughout the different EU treaties is that increasingly more and more competences have been uploaded to the European level in terms of trade. Now, one of the reasons for doing that is pragmatic. So if we go back to international trade negotiations in the 50s, 60s, 70s, even even throughout most of the 80s, actually, a lot of the international negotiation in the WTO's predecessor in the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs were about goods. 
they were about tariffs and about quotas. So they were fairly, well, I wouldn't say simple because they're looking at all kinds of goods, but they were about very particular issues. And the European member states had delegated that power to the Commission, so it was not a problem. Now, when you come to the Uruguay Round, and then once the WTO is established in 1995, you have more and more issues coming on board in international trade negotiations. So things like services. And that includes you know, telecommunications, uh, computers, apps, uh, aviation, all of these things. As these are being uploaded into international trade negotiations, it becomes more and more difficult for the European Union because they've got the trade commissioner discussing goods with exclusive competence, and you've got mixed competences in other areas, such as services or investment. So increasingly, in every treaty, more and more of these mixed competences have been uploaded uh, to the European level. The Treaty of Lisbon, for example, finally granted the European Commission the power to negotiate investment agreements on behalf of the member states. And they're using that newly found power to negotiate an investment agreement with China and to uh, go through all the different trade partners and start negotiating investment agreements with them. The other important thing to mention, and this will become clear later, is the European Parliament. Now, their role has also been enhanced in terms of trade, particularly in the Treaty of Lisbon. Typically, their only power was really a nuclear option. So once the Commission has gone out and negotiated a trade agreement or negotiated something like the WTO, uh, the European Parliament, all they had to do was a yes or no vote. Now, clearly, the nuclear option of voting no it's very difficult to implement because it lose, you know, makes the European Union lose a lot of credibility internationally. It will have significant consequences. And typically, the Parliament has never voted you know, to any treaty. With the Treaty of Lisbon, they gain powers to be more involved in the entire process. So they now have to vote at the same time as the member states. They now get all the documents. Uh, the European Commission has put in place procedures whereby they are in constant contact with the European Parliament and constantly telling them what they're doing and getting feedback from the Parliament so that they know that whatever they negotiate, the Parliament will accept. But it does create uh, an extra complication. And we'll see this when we look at ideas of trade policy and the linkage between trade policy and foreign, and foreign policy. The European Parliament has typically been a defender, not always, but typically a defender of rights, of rights of the individual at the European level. And in terms of foreign policy, they are extremely keen and concerned that the European Union should promote things like human rights, like democracy elsewhere in the world. In their reports on trade agreements, they've been adamant that they will only approve trade agreements that include uh, binding clauses on democracy and human rights that make the implementation of trade uh, preferences contingent on relatively good human rights records um, and respect for the rule of law. And increasingly, they're also making it very clear that they want binding rules on social and environmental clauses and sustainable development in those agreements. Now, this is something that whilst the European Commission and EU member states are happy to include, it's something that many of the, trade, of the EU's trade partners are adamant that they do not want, that they don't think that these are trade issues and they don't think that trade agreements and trade negotiations are the appropriate forum for this. So this is creating an increasing tension within the European Union. Uh, the other tension comes from the fact that, uh, as uh, Sharp pointed out in his uh, seminal article on joint decision tra making tracks, um, you have an issue between input legitimacy and uh, democ dem and democracy, essentially. For the European Union, for the European member states, Pulling their sovereignty together in trade policy has been, I would argue, successful. 
And I say that because if you ask anybody anywhere in the world, okay, anybody at uh, the policy making level, I should say, maybe not the man on the street, um, they would all recognize the EU immediately. And they would recognize it as an economic power and as a crucial trade and investment partner. Uh, work that has been done on such as the European Union abroad has always pointed that out. So it is this area and the possibility of pulling their sovereignty together that has made them more important internationally. Uh, a lot of the research on negotiating with the EU and what it's like reveals that at the WTO context, for example, other, other states are very aware of the power that the EU holds by speaking together, by coming up with one position together. And they probably wouldn't have that power if they went as individual member states, because as we will see, they don't necessarily agree all of the time on everything. So this creates a tension. Uh, on the one hand, trade policy has been efficient for the EU's member states, but of course, as they have to agree to it together, it means that individual interest will not be represented 100% of the time. So there will be times when member states or when individual groups will not have their particular interests and concerns represented in the EU's trade policy, but rather the opposite. And we'll look at some examples of that in a few minutes when we look at EU-China trade relations. So in terms of uh, external negotiations, how does this work? Well, Sarah Collinson uh, describes this as a three-level game. Because if you remember the slide, the blue slide, with all the different institutions and all the different influences, you've got many different layers of uh, negotiations and bargaining. So you've got, first of all, the domestic setting. So each of the 28 member states has to come up with their own trade preferences with the groups that they want to protect from external competition, with the kind of markets that they want to open up elsewhere, with the concessions that they're willing to make in different areas. And the governments will be put under pressure by different groups. So in the case of France, for example, I know it's quite uh, a cliche to mention it, but typically agricultural lobbyists will go to the government and say, well, be careful, we don't want more competition in our market. So make sure that we do retain some sort of protection for maybe wines or for other products. Um, if you think of Germany, for example, the German government is under a lot of pressure from the pharmaceutical sector, also car manufacturing sector, um, to make sure that throughout the world, tariffs, restrictions, and quotas on those types of goods are reduced to a minimum because they are quite competitive and they want to be able to export more of those goods elsewhere, anywhere in the world. So different member states will be put under different pressures. Then each member state will have to come up with its position, its core, the core issues it wants to defend and it wants the EU to represent internationally. And then they will have to battle it out in the council and bargain with the other member states until they come around a unified European position, and then the European Commission will defend and represent that unified position elsewhere. Now, in the case of trade negotiations, be it at the bilateral level or be it at the World Trade Organization, whatever the EU comes up with is not necessarily what the final outcome is going to be, because they're then going to have to negotiate with others. And in any negotiation process, you've got a process of give and take. So typically, the WTO outcomes or the outcomes of bilateral agreements will not be 100% what the EU's original position was, but they will be some sort of uh, meeting the other partner halfway. Depending on the partner, it might not be halfway. It might be much closer to the European's position, but, uh, but it won't necessarily be that. So as you can see, from the original member states to the final outcomes, you're going to have quite a lot of differentiation. So particular interests will be lost along the way. OK, so let's see what, let's see what the European Commission actually does in terms of trade. What, what does this actually look like on the ground? Well, um, the main task 
use trade policy is mandated in the treaties and it is to contribute in the common interest to the harmonious development of world trade, progressive abolition of restrictions on international barriers, and lowering of custom barriers. The wording of this article, this is from the Treaty of Lisbon, or the Treaty of the Function of the EU, um, but the wording has been exactly the same since 1957, the Treaty of Rome. This is one of the core areas where the mandate hasn't really changed very much in all of these years. And if you look at that, I mean, legally the EU is being mandated to expand free trade. So that kind of free trade bias is in, has been included there from the very beginning. Now we will see, sorry, we will see when we look at an interest and, and ideas that it has been mediated by other ideas throughout time. So the way that this is pursued may change in the outward appearance, but the actual aim has always been the same. Irrespective of what member states might think at different points in time, the European Commission has always been mandated to expand free trade, to lower barriers. And of course, in order to achieve that, the EU is also going to have to lower barriers as well. And how does it actually how does it actually go about doing it? What does kind of powers does the Commission have? Well, um, unilaterally. The European Union will pursue its trade interests through external tariffs uh, and through the imposition of trade sanctions, for example, anti dumping measures. I've got a picture there of shoes. Uh, in the past years, there have been many cases of investigations into uh, claims that uh, Chinese textile companies, shoemakers, etc., were. Um, dumping their products in Europe, in other words, selling them at a low cost uh, so as to expand their market share. Now, these complaints have been brought about by European textile and uh, shoe manufacturers. They've been investigated, and then when it comes to imposing sanctions, uh, it becomes very difficult because you have tensions between different groups within Europe. In essence, all of those Chinese products that are being imported into Europe, very often they're being imported by European retailers. So you have different interests between retail sector and manufacturers, for example. Uh, you'll have different interests between different particular companies. So you will have companies that have moved production to China or overseas and are keen to be able to import that back into the EU as easily as possible without any restrictions and you have companies that have chosen to retain their productive base within Europe and therefore want protection from these uh, cheaper goods from abroad. So these internal tensions are there and when we talk about the EU speaking with one voice in trade, it might eventually try to put on one, one voice and, and the appearance of unity, but to reach that point there's still an awful lot of discussion and internal disunity in this. Other unilateral trade policies that the European Union pursues include the GSP, that stands for General System of Preferences, and that is essentially uh, a system whereby developing states are allowed to export anything that they want into the EU uh, without any quotas, without any tariffs, without any of well, those official barriers. Um, and part of this comes from the fact that if you look at European Union trade, but also development policy, increasingly they hold the belief that trade is a way of further development. Uh, the Everything But Arms is essentially uh, an enhanced GSP system for the world's least developed countries, and they can export anything they could possibly produce without any barriers to the EU, provided it's not weapons. So that's the one restriction. So I'll say a little bit about the EU-China trade relationship because increasingly it's uh, being portrayed in the media as being problematic. I would argue it's increasingly normalized because if we look at the EU's US trade relationship, they've also had some very high profile um, complaints <coughs> and cases uh, and cases that they've brought to the World Trade Organization accusing one another of being uh, unfair in their trade practices. Now, 
the EU and China have now become each other's pretty much largest trade partners. So there is a, a very important element of interdependence at the moment. This may change in 10 years' time. I don't have a crystal ball, so I can't tell you that. But at the moment, they each need, they need one another. Um, I'm not sure if you can see the little drawings. And typically, um, a large portion of what the EU imports from China is uh, goods and manufactured goods. Uh, in a large portion of what China imports from the EU are luxury goods, uh, luxury cars, but also increasingly services. So the EU runs a surplus with China in terms of services, it runs a deficit in terms of uh, manufactured goods. And in terms of uh, investment, the relationship is increasing both ways, but still has a long way to go, hence why they're negotiating an investment agreement to be able for European companies to invest more easily in China, but also for, to attract more Chinese investment into the European Union by uh, clarifying some of the rules uh, around that. I'm going to say a little bit about one particular recent um, case of, um, of conflict between the EU and China, and that is the solar panel case. And I think it's interesting also because it has that link with energy policy, which I also was telling you about before. And I know he's been doing some work on it, so if you have any further questions, you can always uh, ask him in, in further sessions as well. In terms of uh, solar panels, um, the technology for the production of solar panels really started in the US and in, based in Germany, typically, in, in Europe. Increasingly, China has become quite good at it, particularly at the later stages of the production, so at the putting together the final panels, to a large extent with imported goods and imported, imported components coming from Europe, typically. Um, but increasingly, China has become um, a key actor in terms of the production of solar panels. They are responsible for almost 80% of global production, most of which is for the export market and gets exported back to the US or to Europe. And as you can see here, the largest customer uh, for those solar panels is the European Union. The availability, actually, of cheap solar panels from China has actually helped to increase the uptake of solar technologies in Europe. And you know, so it all, it's all interrelated and works together. Now, what happened in 2012 was that as the Chinese were becoming more competitive and taking a larger share of the markets, uh, the Americans, first of all, decided to put some tariffs on their um, Chinese solar panels. They accused China of dumping the panels, and they imposed some tariffs. Now, the Chinese were very quiet about this, in part because the US market is was smaller than the European one, and in part because they were able to plow some of those uh, tariffs by exporting via Taiwan. Now, some months later, in, uh, in 2012, the EU receives a complaint, so the European Commission, I should say, receives a complaint. And it's a complaint from um, a newly formed association of solar panel manufacturers in Europe called ProSun, uh, which was created by SolarWorld, which is one of Europe's largest producers of solar panels. Now, this association represented 25% of the industry, which is the minimum that is required for them to be able to put a complaint to the European Commission. So the Commission receives this complaint, and they are legally bound to investigate. This is not optional. They have to investigate. So they launch investigations into uh, dumping and possible dumping and uh, possible subsidies to the solar panel industry in China. And the Chinese were not very happy with this, so they started to be very vocal about this and to complain not just to the European Commission, but to individual member states and to anybody who would listen or who would have a say in all of this. Uh, the investigations take quite a long time, and it's in June 2013 that the European Commission votes to impose temporary tariffs of, um, the initial tariffs were of 11.5% 
So it's much lower than the 80% that their study, their study revealed that uh, Chinese products were being sold at 88% uh, lower than they should be sold. Uh, the initial tariffs that they proposed were fairly low, 11.5%. The idea was that if nothing changed in two months, they would be raised to 47.6%. The Chinese government was not very happy with this. Uh, the Chinese Prime Minister went on a tour of the <laughs> European capitals uh, to raise his concerns about this and, of course, had discussions with the European Commission to try to come up with some agreement. Now, what's interesting about this is that most member states were actually against this. So um, there were only six member states that actually voted in favor of having these types of tariffs put in place. Uh, others abstained or voted against. Now the reason for this are various various reasons. On the one hand, concerns about potential consequences for other industries. The Chinese made some noises about potentially investigating and putting tariffs and putting restrictions on the export of luxury cars, for example, to, to China. Uh, they also started their own investigation, again, at the behest of their industry. It just happened that at the time it was quite uh, coincidental uh, into EU subsidies and into EU um, alleged dumping of wine in China. So they started to put pressure on different states. Now, that would have affected in particular Italy and France, which were countries that were, they were voting in favor of tariffs on Chinese solar panels. Um, we also saw a very uh, public battle between the European Commission and the member states played out in the media. So you had northern member states arguing that this was not the right fight to have with China, despite the fact that in terms of monetary value, this was the largest um, trade conflict ever. But they argued, well, it's not crucial to us. And uh, this is not what we should be fighting about. The European Commissioner for Trade, Carol de Bucht, in the media was also very vocal and very strong about the fact that this was his patch, that he was following the laws, and that the member states should do well to just keep their mouth shut, because this was not their competence anymore. Uh, so we saw this kind of battle of powers being played out. Now, I would argue there may have been some positioning on the part of Carol de Bucht and the European Commission because this was also a way of making it very clear to the Chinese that when we come to negotiate an investment agreement, it is the Commission, it is us you're dealing with and not the member state. They've given up with these powers and we want you to be aware that it is with us, with your interlocutor and not the states. Um, at the end of the EU's investment, well, once the provisional tariffs were put in place, there was an awful lot of a shot of diplomacy taking place, and the European Commission and the Chinese government came up with an agreement. So final tariffs were not put in place. They were not implemented. Uh, the agreement essentially was one whereby Chinese companies agreed to increase the price at which they sell in Europe. So it's a price undertaking agreement. Uh, the both sides were quite satisfied with this. What's interesting also is also the timing. This was a time when the Chinese government was removing a lot of its uh, support to the solar panel industry. So they were, this industry had grown tremendously because it was a way of creating a lot of jobs in different regions. And what you had was the situation where the regional leaders, and not necessarily Beijing, were um, encouraging the creation of more and more factories to produce solar panels. And they were supporting that through regional banks by uh, giving very generous uh, support to these companies. So you end up with a situation with hundreds of solar panel making companies in China with a massive capacity that has dropped global prices significantly, and a situation where you've got an oversupply for not enough demand. So the Chinese government was also keen to rationalize solar panel industry within China at the same time. And in a way, the final agreement with the EU allowed them to do that because they've been choosing which companies 
agree to that price undertaking and can therefore continue to export to the EU. Other companies have not been allowed to come into this price undertaking, and that means they will face quite stiff tariffs. So the idea will be that they will essentially become less and less competitive and eventually have to close down or be absorbed by other companies. And it is one of the aims of, of, of the Chinese leadership to try to rationalize the, the, the market within China. And rather than have hundreds and hundreds of competing companies, have fewer, stronger, bigger, uh, more important companies. In terms of the solution, it was really a win-win situation for both parties. Um, you know, if you look at the European side, the Trade Commissioner argued this was an amicable solution, which will lead to new market equilibrium and sustainable prices. Uh, Pro-Sun, uh, pro who brought the complaint, uh, are then taking it to court because they're not happy with this. But it's also important to recognize that actually the solar panel making industry within Europe is, is not that large. It's very difficult to find data on how many jobs it supports, but I did find somewhere a report that argued it was about 25,000 jobs. There's another report that claims there are three, over 300,000 jobs in the installation maintenance uh, of solar panel industry within Europe. So in an industry that is supported through cheap imports, uh, therefore, that gives us some idea of the different, uh, the different interests in different countries and different groups within Europe and how they are then played out internationally. In this case, it was done very, um, in, in the public eye. Often it is done behind closed doors. And in terms of the Chinese side, well, you've got uh, one of the solar companies' managers uh, arguing that actually, okay, we know that with the higher price, we will sell fewer units. However, because the price is higher, we still end up being in the same position or even in a slightly better position. So, no big deal. But it does represent all those tensions very well. Um, what other things does the EU do? Well, I've already mentioned that the European Commission negotiates in fora like the World Trade Organization on behalf of the whole of, of all the member states. Uh, in terms of the World Trade Organization, the EU's position has changed through time. Initially, they were very much, uh, much more defensive, and it was the Americans who were taking the lead in pushing global liberalization. Uh, but increasingly, since the 1990s, the European Union has been much more on the part of the Americans. And they have been one of the key driving forces behind uh, trying to upload to the WTO agenda the liberalization of services, uh, having very strong comprehensive intellectual property rights, um, having um, opening up government procurement markets. Government procurement is anything from the building of roads, bridges, to um, you know, catering services for Parliament, for example. And, and all of these things the Americans and the Europeans put on the WTO don't around agenda. And all of these things fell off the WTO Doha Round agenda because the rest of the world is not so keen to discuss them and to liberalize in that way. Because it conflicts with many of their own domestic policies uh, to gear development, for example. And what you have both the EU and the Americans doing that is moving to bilateral agreements and negotiating agreements with individual countries or groups of countries, uh, agreements that would include all of these issues that fell off the WTO agenda. Now for both of them, it's much easier to get those things agreed in a bilateral agreement uh, because they have much more structural power. The EU is much more important to Peru's economy than Peru is to the European Union's economy. And the same happens with the case of the US. Therefore, if they want Peru to sign up to opening up its government procurement market, it's going to be much easier to do it on an individual basis than through the WTO, where different uh, states in South America, or India, China as well, can get together and say, well, actually, we disagree with this, so we're not signing up. At the bilateral level, it is much easier to assert that asymmetrical power. And as you can see from here, the EU, as I mentioned earlier, is extremely busy negotiating with 
most countries around the world. Uh, last year, it started negotiations with the United States that will be the most challenging and the largest trade negotiation probably ever. And uh, then we've ever seen. It's not clear exactly how that will work out and, and what the outcome of that will be, but um, there is an awful lot of political will to push that forward. Next week, we're having a fifth round of negotiations. That is incredibly fast, they only started last year. So there is a big push to uh, create a whole set of regulations to harmonize their economic systems to facilitate even more trade and investment between them. And I'm very aware of the time, so I'll just raise one final, one final point very quickly, which is the issue of trade policy as a foreign policy tool. Now, this slide is quite out of date. I found it a couple of years ago in an old EU document hidden somewhere in the, uh, on the web, and it is, well, you might be able to find it, but I think it's incredibly difficult to find because I tried to find it again and couldn't. So I was very glad I had rescued this particular slide. Before 2006, the European Union's trade policy was, according to the EU itself, dominated by these concepts. So its aim was to contribute to sustainable development by integrating more countries into world trade. So that was the rhetoric and the discourse that the European Union was um, pushing forward. Now, if you remember, I said earlier that from the very beginning, in terms of the treaties, the EU is mandated, the European Commission is mandated to liberalize global markets. Here, yeah. still doing it, because it wants to incorporate more countries into the global trading system, but here it's focusing on sustainable development. And it was doing this through different ways. On the one hand, pursuing its own economic interests of market opening, on the other hand, exporting its own norms and standards in terms of you know, things like rules of um, how you test products, for example, but also rules on labor standards and what health and safety should look like in the, work, in the workplace. We could argue that all of these things uh, affect production costs and business costs so that they're also to some extent, uh, economic interest. But it was also doing it by pursuing its normative aims. And it does this through linkage clauses or conditionality clauses, or I think the Canadians and the New Zealanders call them suspension clauses, and academics would like to call them democracy clauses. And basically, it means that the European Union, in its trade agreements since the 1990s, it includes a complementary political cooperation agreement which says that the parties will cooperate on a whole range of issues, like education policy, energy, all sorts of things. It's non-binding cooperation, so they can choose what they cooperate in. But it does include a clause that says that the agreements are built on shared values of human rights, of democracy, etc. And that if these are breached, the European Commission, yeah, the European Union, can suspend other treaties that they have with that country, typically the trade treaty, because that would be the one bit that would fight and hurt the other country. Now, this is quite controversial, but this is really one of the key areas, this and through development policy, that the European Union has had to change other countries' behavior and to use to pursue its own, um, its own foreign policy aims. Because if you think about it, the EU even today does not really have a military a military capability or an army that it could use to pursue certain policies elsewhere. So it has done it through trade. And I'm going to skip this one. So I'll just say a little bit more about those ideas. When Pascal Lamy was head of the European Commission between 1999 and 2005, uh, he was very keen on these issues of the linkage between trade and development, on the idea of harnessing globalization. Now, he was a Frenchman. Uh, he, yeah, he's in favor of free trade, but you know, with some nuances. And that comes through in the European Union's policy at that time. However, 
that changes in the mid 2000s when Pascal Lamy is sent off to head the WTO. And you have uh, in first Peter Mandelson, who is British, and then Carol de Gouffre, who is the current EU Trade Commissioner. And these are individuals who are very committed to free trade, to liberalization throughout the world. And uh, they're also very concerned about development sales rights. So by the mid 2000s, it's very clear that the Do Doha round is not prospering. All of those issues I mentioned earlier that the EU wanted liberalized at the WTO are fallen off the agenda. So by pursuing them bilaterally, the EU is able to bring them back onto the agenda and to gain market access and business opportunities for European businesses. Um, this is all encapsulated in the Global Europe uh, Agenda of 2006, where competition with what the Americans were doing was a key concern, and it comes out very clearly in, in the document and in the discourses of the time. And in this, at this stage, the EU prioritizes Asia as this is a part of the world with uh, growing markets, uh, growing middle classes that will be able to consume more and more European goods and services in the future, and an area that still retains some um, protectionism. The only thing I really want to raise about the current trade strategy, trade growth and world affairs from 2010, is that it follows up very closely from the 2006 Global Europe Agenda. It's basically the same thing we package. It does establish a link with, uh, obviously, 2010 is after the start of the financial and economic crisis. So it establishes a clear link between trade and uh, potential growth of jobs in Europe. And I'll just finish off with a quick summary. Well, in summary, this is a an area, uh, a policy area where power has been delegated to the European Union level. However, as Sophie Meunier asked in her article in 2000, what single voice, when you dig deeper, there are still a lot of complex internal dynamics taking at play. You've got a principal agent relationship between the states and the Commission. You've got the increasing role of the European Parliament. And again, we've got a slight question mark over that because we're not entirely sure how that will develop in the future. Uh, we've got tensions even between the member states and the Commission in areas where the competences are quite clear. And some of these tensions were played out publicly in the EU-China solar panel dispute. We've got competition sorry, between different economic sectors and we've got different economic interests, the material and regulatory interests that are being defended and pushed through this uh, policy, and they are often in attention with the European Union's foreign policy objectives, normative aims, and some of its uh, mandated, legally mandated normative aims. And I'm afraid I'm out of time, so I won't be able to discuss some of these questions with you, but I'll just show them to you, because I think in terms of of this policy, there are to some extent still many questions out there, perhaps more questions um, than answers. And I think some of these are some of the key issues that we're going to see developing uh, in this field in the coming years. Issues such as can the EU export its way out of the crisis as it hopes to do? Um, in this complex web of interests and ideas, who will win the day? Will the EU eventually have to separate its normative aims from its uh, economic interests? as pursued in trade policy. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much.